And we have two wonderful guests today who will talk more about the topic of forming alliances. And they've traveled very far. And the first, and they will have, we have heard two speeches now and from Nimo Basse and Sheila Manon. And first we hear uh, Nimo Basse and he's traveled all the way from Nigeria and he has worked, he has been an activist for many, many years fighting against um, yeah, the violent extraction of fossil fuels in Nigeria and um, other parts. And he also won the, uh, the Life, right, Livelihood Award, the Alternative, uh, right, <laughs> okay. Alternative Nobel Prize. And um, he works for the, um, okay. Um, okay, can you please <laughs> come and talk? <laughs> Okay. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Could you just join your hands with somebody? Join your hands with somebody next to you. All right, we're going to chant together. A people united can never be defeated. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to see whether you would understand my accent. <laughs> um, it's a real pleasure for me to be a part of this camp. I wish I came on the first day and I wish I could stay to the last moment. But the few moments I've been here have been very inspiring, seeing a lot of energy, and I could just feel a sense of readiness to move to the next stages of action. And it's not by accident that I'm speaking today on forming alliances. Um, we're talking about alliances across borders across the continents of the world because we are living in a world that is faced with global disasters, crisis, economic disasters, financial disasters, climate disasters, all you, food disasters, everything you can think about is going down in the wrong direction. And we can only tackle this by working in global alliances. We can't solve this problem standing in our corner of the world, we, but we must do something in every corner of the world. And then we have to connect the dots and, and see all this bubble up into a big global movement. I feel particularly inspired being here because of the criminal coal mine, the criminal coal mining that is going on around here. And I call this criminal because when you take action that destroys nature, actions that overturns everything that is about the culture of a location, the best way to describe it is ecocide. And ecocide is a crime. Am I right? Well, we have the saying, leave the oil in the soil, leave the coal in the hole, <laughs> and leave the tar sand in the land. I don't know fracking business where we are. So, because fossil fuel has really driven the world to a brink, and coming here and seeing the big hole around here where coal is being extracted is a clear example of what ought not to be done. Uh, and so I believe that being here too gives all of us the energy to globalize the struggle and as Lavia Capesina says, to globalize hope. So number one is that forming alliances is an imperative. We don't have any option because the, the nature of the crisis 
is also global. And the major actors driving the crisis are operating globally. We have transnational corporations. And these transnational corporations are controlling most governments around the world. I'm sure you all know the history of colonialism. And right now, in the neo-colonial setting that we live right now, governments are running territories on behalf of transnational corporations. There was a time in the past when corporations ran governments, ran territories for governments. But now, governments are running territories for corporation. So it's going around. It just go around in circles. So when we form alliances on, to tackle global warming, we're actually forming alliances to undermine the miners, to undermine governments, and to undermine transnational mining corporations. And if we think about it anywhere else, it could be that we do some nice things in corners, living our quiet lives, but at the end of the day, that would not overturn the system. The struggle is to overturn the system. And we can only overturn the system by building alliances and forging cooperation across the borders. Are we still together? Are we still together? <laughs> you know, when, <laughs> when it goes very quiet, I think maybe some people are sleeping already. Okay. Yes, so we, we can't really avoid this. And the, the thing is that sometimes when we look at struggles elsewhere, it looks so distant. It looks like things that doesn't really concern us. But if we map these areas of struggles, the various crime scenes around the world, you find that the underlying factors the underlying struggles are all the same. People are struggling to live in dignity. People are struggling to live, to respect each other, to be re respected. People are struggling to make a living in a living environment. People are struggling to, to say that, look, we are not just humans. We are not the only people on this planet. Our relatives also live in the planet, and they have the right to live on the planet. When I say our relative, I mean other beings around us. And these beings are both visible and invisible. We can, our eyes can see very little. There are very many other beings, depending on the same planet that we live on, who also have a right to survive, have a right to live and to reproduce and to form their own communities. And so when we take care of, form alliances, we take care of Mother Earth, we form alliances across a widespread uh, map of struggles. This morning, I was in a workshop here on uh, talking about the anarchist struggles, and I found that they, everybody ought to be an anarchist. If you are not an anarchist, it means you don't know what's going on around you. Because the anarchist, <laughs> this is what I learned this morning. <laughs> the, the anarchist, anarchist believes in action. The anarchist believes that I don't have to wait until everybody's ready before I take action. If I see something that is wrong, that is the first step. And dear brothers and sisters, I want to also share with you one thing I learned from Subcommandante Marcos. Because some people, or people always say, you are an activist. You campaign on global warming, you campaign against climate change, you campaign against mining. What is the solution? What are your solutions? So they push you into a corner that if you don't have a solution, you have no right to complain. But that is not true. Anyone who can identify a problem has already identified a whole range of solutions. So for every one of us, if you can identify a problem and announce what you found and find somebody else to stand with you against that thing, that you don't want to see happening, then we begin to connect the dots in our local communities, we are already on our way to forging big alliances. And so for me, the most critical thing in the whole struggle is to find something that you can say no to. And once you said no to a thing, the yes and the yeses can be one million. Because there are very many ways to solve particular 
problems. And we can't afford to allow politicians and transnational corporations to determine how problems can be solved. We can't continue to say, well, you know, we exploit Mother Earth because she's there to be exploited. We can always extract, she's not complaining. Mother Earth is crying every day. Mother Earth is struggling every day. And we, the children of Mother Earth, have to stand up and speak for her. We have to stand up and resist for her. We have to stand up and join our hands and in our various diversities and understand and stress the fact that the strength of any alliance lies on its diversity. Can you say that with me? The strength, the strength of any alliance is found in its diversity. Thank you. <laughs> now, that to me, that is actually very important. That is why I'm happy to be different. And everybody must be proud to be different. Live in dignity, be different, and let's all come together because when we come together, then we are strong. Now, in my experience in alliance buildings, building, have worked with groups across the global south and some groups in the global north resisting the expansion of fossil fuels in All Watch International and in All Watch Africa. And We believe that the whole logic that forces the world to continue depending on fossil fuels is a very defective and faulty logic. If you just look at the climate negotiations, you can see the falsehood in the entire logic. People talk about carbon trading, talk about carbon offsetting, but the best, I talk about carbon sequestration, but the best way to sequester carbon is to leave the fossils untapped. Am I right? And so communities that have over the years struggled to leave carbon in the ground ought to be recognized and compensated for leaving the carbon untapped. Which means that the Ogoni people for, in Nigeria who have forced Shell out of their territory since 1993 ought to be paid compensation for forcing the corporation and the government of Nigeria to leave crude oil untapped. That is carbon sequestration. You don't bring it out and then try to capture it. You leave it where Mother Earth, where nature kept it. So we need to challenge the narrative and then be a fine example. We have examples around the world. We have examples in Ecuador, in Yasuni ITT, where the people have said we don't want our oil extracted. And so many other examples. The Tarsan struggles of the First Nations of Northern America. All these struggles are things that, the struggles here, right here against coal expansion, these are struggles that can join, can bring us together in our diversity, in our uh, disagreement with the system to build strong connections. And as I said before, we are all bound together as children of Mother Earth. Where I come from, if you want to identify yourself in a particular community, you say you are a son or daughter of the soil. And so if you are from here, you are a son or daughter of the soil. And nobody has a right to deny you of your soil. Mining denies us of our soil. And we belong to the soil. We came from the soil, we go back to the soil, whether we like it or not. And so nobody has a right to remove our soil from under our feet. So, what I'm saying is this, what I'm saying is this, that our targets may be different, but our objectives are the same. We are building, we're working together to build a world that is sane, a world that is respective, a world that does not depend on the false logic that Power is right. That might is right. We're fighting for a world where the weakest individual, the weakest organism, has the same right as the strongest to survive. And this kind of work is extremely ethical. 
and it forms a great basis, a great basis for all of us to stand together, joining our hands and resisting continually. And I'm going to end with this about resistance. For many years, I've seen resistance as advocacy. Somebody asked me, what is advocacy? I'll say advocacy is resistance. And the best resistance, of course, starts by somebody being standing up against environmental or social misbehavior, standing up to say, this thing cannot go on this way. We won't accept it no matter what. You cannot pay for my life with money. You cannot pay for my water with money. This is a right. I have a right to live. I have a right to live in dignity. And I have a right to form association with whosoever I want to form associations with. When we are thoroughly dissatisfied with the status quo and with the, at the local level, I will begin to form res groups to stand up against uh, such actions, this is the strongest base of resistance. Because resistance has to know, smell, feel, taste that thing that is not acceptable, that thing that is objectionable, that thing that we don't want to continue in our community. And once we have a strong base, a strong wellspring of resistance, of rejecting environmental or political misbehavior, and saying this cannot continue this way, things have to change. Once we have a large mass agreeing to do that at the local level, and we have people in other locations in the world agreeing to stand up against this sort of behavior, then we are on our way to forging alliances. And this is, as I said at the beginning, completely inescapable. It's not a thing that we have a choice. It's not a matter of choice. It is something, it's imperative. It's something that we just have to do because we deserve to live a life of dignity. Mother Earth deserves to support her children. And we are the children of Mother Earth, a people united who can never be defeated, a people united can never be defeated. A people united can never be defeated. You know, when we make that chant, it's not because it sounds beautiful too much, but it's a very fundamental fact that if we understand that we have commonalities in all our struggles, those commonalities should unite us. There may be differences, and that's okay, but the things that we hold common the things that we hold dear, these are the things we need to stress, and these are the things that nobody can take from us. I thank you for your wonderful attention. Okay, and let's move on to the new talk. Sheila, please. <laughs> Great you're here. Climate activist from the UK and involved in actions against um, Heathrow Airport, for example. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, it's a lot of people. <laughs> um, so, uh, about two years ago, I I'm part of uh, several different grassroots groups, but uh, one of them is called Reclaim the Power. And about two years ago, there was a call out for uh, grassroots groups and individuals to come to Cologne uh, to meet and talk about how we would strategize together in the run up to the COP21 in Paris. And I volunteered because I thought, great, go to Germany for a few days, fantastic. And uh, not many people volunteered because people were busy. And I came with two others And in that meeting, everybody was like, wow, people from England, oh my God, what does it take to get you guys over here? This is really amazing that you guys have come. And we were really surprised. Uh, and uh, we, it, it, this, this meeting really made us see that there was a really large uh, gap between us and um, what, was, what was going on in, in, in the rest of Europe. 
And we came because it, we, in, at that time and still now in Britain, uh, fracking is a very, very large issue. And it's on the front, you know, it's, it's, it's really up there in one of the main campaigns that's being fought on the ground. And we came and obviously we were like coming with our fracking heads on and nobody was talking about fracking in this meeting. And we were like, oh, shit, okay. It's not relevant to everybody else. And it really made us see, actually, yeah, like how much of a gap there was in what we were doing, how disconnected we were from what was happening in the rest of Europe, and actually how disconnected we were in terms of people knowing what's happening in, in the UK. Um, so that meeting was the start of a process, and that process formed a group, uh, a network, a coalition, if you like, a, a network, Actually, it's a network, it's not a coalition. Uh, and uh, or an open network of grassroots groups and individuals, which uh, is now called Climate Justice Action. Um, <laughs> and, that, and that group is still meeting. So the idea was to meet in the, um, and to, to strategize in the run-up to Paris and to meet, but to, to, to be um, seeing beyond Paris and seeing Paris as an opportunity for for groups from many different countries to come together and network and build alliances so that we can work on issues together um, and not in our isolated uh, territories. And so that's still happening. That, meet, that group is still meeting. And um, there's still um, um, an initiative to see where, which direction to take that. There, I think there's going to be a meeting soon in Brussels. So it was really, I was very honored to be part of that. And as part of that, like more people came, I went back, we went back, we said, guys, you have to come to the next one of these meetings. So more people came and more people came and we made some amazing friends, um, amazing connections. And off the back of that, a lot of people came to Endegelenda last year because of that. A lot of people went to Frackenpada. In fact, last summer just seemed to be, everybody was going to camps all over Europe and that really hadn't happened before. So, <laughs> so for me, that was a really positive experience of, of, um, of taking that step to forming alliances uh, with people in, in other countries in, in the rest of Europe. Um, I still, as um, somebody who's very interested in global south politics, definitely feel, uh, and you know, how, how we're... Um, representing or how we are including the voices of, of the Global South struggles, I still feel there's a long way to go in bringing that voice into that space, but it's a start and, and there is a lot of work to be done. I think we all have a lot of work on, in that area. Um, because otherwise what happens is the solutions that we come up with um, in addressing the, the and, and tackling those struggles and addressing them and the solutions to, to overcome them become very Eurocentric or very like Global North centric. So it's a really important um, thing to, to make those alliances, not just with other people who are in our part of the world, but, but reaching out as far as we can. So I think actually when we're talking about forming alliances, one of the things that I've realized is a big part of the problem, certainly when we talk about climate change, is that climate change, climate, climate, CO2 emissions, it's some there, it's out there, it's this thing that we can't really touch and we can't really feel and we, we don't see the direct impact of the thing that's happening. And, and it's, it's quite abstract for a lot of people to, to kind of grasp, actually. Um, you know, even though everybody is in agreement, mostly, that, that we, it's, we have to do something, it still can be quite an abstract concept. So I think we need to reframe climate and, and I think that's an important part of forming alliances. Um, because by keeping it as this separate issue, climate is this thing over here, and then agriculture is this thing over here, and then race is this thing over here, but actually climate is a race issue. It is a class issue. It, it, it's, it is about, um, I mean, it affects everyone and everything. Climate change doesn't know borders and it doesn't differentiate. It affects all of us. Um, it's a class issue. It's a labor issue in terms of tr um, labor workforce. 
Um, it's, a, it's a gender issue in terms of when we look at who will be impacted by climate change and, and, and how in, in different parts of the world. It's obviously, it's a health issue. Um, and it's a po uh, poverty and austerity issue. It is about democracy. It is about sovereignty. It is about energy justice. And it's about corporatization and globalization. But when... <laughs> I think when we talk about climate change, we need to make it relevant to, to the things which, which are like, you know, there in front of people's faces. We need to make it relevant to the struggles that they're dealing with day to day. So if we can reframe climate and integrate climate, instead of putting it over here in a box that's a separate issue, we need to integrate climate change into the narrative of all these other issues so that they become an integral part of the story and the challenge and the solutions as well. Um, it's, yeah, I don't know, back to that bit. <laughs> so what we think of as the, as often what we think of as the, the causes of climate change are, is that my 10 minute warning? Yeah, okay, cool. What we think of as the, as the causes of climate change are still often only the symptomatic uh, impact. So like we talk about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we talk about um, temperature, global temperature rise um, and carbon emissions, but actually, and, and we all know this, is, where's that system change, climate change? Though? We all know this. These, they're all part of, they're, they're, they, these are all just symptoms of the real root causes of climate change. Um, and, and so the way to, to address those root causes is to actually broaden the way that we talk about climate. So yeah, so how do we do this? We do this through, we can do this through forming alliances, but, but how do we do that? Well, when we want to reach out to, like, so let's say we're a, a group that's you know, working on fossil fuel extraction, uh, and we want to reach out to a group that's working on, on issues of race or class, how do we do that? It's through solidarity, but we need to understand and acknowledge what solidarity means. Solidarity isn't like, and diversity. So diversity of our groups, um, it's a thing that, you know, we all uh, acknowledge that in the global north, um, climate is typically a white middle class kind of struggle uh, in a lot of places, definitely in England. Um, and, and so if you want to reach out from that, how do we do that? Well. Well, we don't just say, well, how do we make this more interesting to these other communities? How do we bring these other groups in to make uh, them interested in climate change? Because climate change is relevant to them, and it's really important to them, so how do we bring them in? It doesn't work like that. What we have to do is go and sit in their camp not ask them to come and sit in our camp. We need to sit in their camp and understand what the world looks like from their perspective so that we can really understand what their issues and their struggles that they're dealing with day to day, what their reality looks like. And only then can we find a way to make climate relevant to what they're already facing and what they're already fighting. But when this has been suggested, you know, when this has been discussed, I've, I've heard conversations amongst, especially amongst grassroots groups where people are working for, you know, no money in their spare time and they're putting all the hours that they can and, and, and it's never enough. Uh, and they say, well, but if we go and start campaigning on their issue, on all these other issues, we dilute our resources and we don't have anything left to, to, you know, to work on the issue that, that we're here to work on. And really that's a short-sighted way of approaching this because until we start to build those alliances with all of those other issues and really that, like, that's the way that we can really start to tackle the systemic causes of climate change. Because until we do that, we're all dealing, working in our isolated pockets and, and our movement can only grow so much. So, um, yeah, I wanted to just, there was a, there's a group, there's another little story. So there's a group um, um, that has formed in, in the UK, um, Voices of the Global South, they're called Wretched of the Earth. And um, it was a really interesting conversation because about um, 
Uh, I, I'm working on an aviation campaign because of an action that I took last year, and I'm, we're trying to fight aviation expansion all over the world. And, uh, and we wanted to, to um, bring them in to, to talk. And actually, you know, I understand aviation, climate change, carbon emissions, and there are lots of other issues around it. And, and it was like, well, but if we bring, if, you know, if we, if we come along to this, actually aviation is quite an important part of our connection with our communities back home. Actually, why is the climate movement telling us what issues to get involved with? Why are they not asking us what issues we want to get involved with? And that's the key. Like, it's no good us going to them and telling them what they need to be um, concerned about and what they need to be working on. We need to really be listening to those voices. So when we want to um, show acts of solidarity, it's not about taking our agenda there. It's about really listening to hear what their agenda is um, and supporting them wholeheartedly in their agenda. I'm going to tell another little story, so I hope we've still got time. So um, there's another group that I'm part of called uh, BP or Not BP, and we campaign against oil sponsorship of cultural arts uh, um, uh, institutions. So the very big museums in London that are sponsored by BP. Um, and what this does is it gives them, uh, it gives the energy oil companies social license to operate because it legitimizes what they're doing when it, they look very good because they're sponsoring these fantastic um, exhibitions. And so we, um, we, we reached out to a trade union. And there was a trade union that, there's a trade union that represents the workers of these museums. And they were, they were fighting an issue around the privatization of the staff in these muse museums. And there was one particular woman who, there, there was some blacklisting. People were blacklisted for speaking out against the privatization. And there was one woman who had been fired for trying to uh, speak out and, and unionize people around this issue. So we joined them and we supported their, their campaign, their struggle, and we, we turned up at their demos and we um, tweeted and you know, we, we, we shouted about their issue. And it gave us an opportunity to talk about corporate sponsorship and corporate privatization, which really is part of the same problem. And as a result of the support and the solidarity which we showed, we've now been able to work with them so that the trade union has now made it, a, a, they passed a motion to make it a priority to work towards ending oils, um, corporate, oil sponsorship of, of the arts for climate. And we've also brought um, a, a member from from Colombia who was uh, who did it um, in one of we do theatrical interventions. So we asked him to come along, and he spoke about the role that BP played in his abduction. And we gave him the stage, and we let the messaging be his, and we let them kind of lead. Um, and, and that face-to-face -face connection is, is really important. It's a thing that I realized when I came to Cologne and through the meetings, the CJ meetings, and actually I wouldn't be here today if that meeting hadn't happened and if I hadn't been part of that process. So face-to-face -face meetings, face-to-face -face connection is a really important part of that forming um, alliances. And um, you, international mobilizations like the COP21 um, are, are definitely really useful ways or useful um, moments to, to draw upon that. So for people to come together and, and connect with other people and stand in solidarity with each other and be united um, and standing and work, working and challenging the same, the same issues. Um, but as well as big international mobilizations. I also believe it's important to, um, to support local resistance. So uh, I spent some time at Lazad earlier on in this year after being found guilty of the action we took against an air airport. Uh, we then came to Lazad to try and take action against that airport. And uh, it, it, but it was really important to come and be there 
and be part of that local struggle to really understand what their perspective, because although we're working on a similar issue, the context is very different in France and in all the other countries working on aviation. So um, coming together allow, can allow us to cross-pollinate our messages like we did with the oil, uh, with the, the museum sponsorship. Um, but it, and it allows us to kind of, yeah, really support local struggles, but also local initiatives. It's not all about anti, anti, anti. It's very important that we're also supporting the local solution-based initiatives uh, and, and supporting those. Because I think, um, actually, site battles alone will not get us where we need to get to. That's, I mean, in my opinion. Um, I think that if, if, we wanted, if we want to achieve if we want, what, we, what we want to achieve, we really need to join the dots uh, between struggles and movements through real solidarity uh, with, with recognition of the power dynamics between, um, between those that we are acting in solidarity with. And that's another key thing, a really important thing that we need to be aware of so that we can give a platform to the voices who are quieter so that they can be heard louder, to acknowledge historical responsibilities and not just kind of act and say like, okay, so now we all need to work together, but actually acknowledging that equality doesn't always equal justice. Like, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get to achieve justice. And only then do I think that we can really bring about the system change that we're all working on to truly tackle climate change. So we have time for some a couple of questions to Sheila. This was the first. Um. Yeah, thank you for your nice talk. I'm all with you. I'm all for alliances and also international alliances. Um, I was just wondering how can we um, think degrowth together with that because. Like, for me personally, I know it's not only about personal decisions, um, doing something against climate change and doing something for degrowth and so on, but um, I think it's also about personal decisions. And if we, as activists, fly here and there and everywhere, we're kind of part of the problem. And I, I would like to know what you think about that. It's a really interesting conversation. So, as I mentioned, I'm currently involved in organizing a mass action at a major London airport, um, just involved in the, obviously, talking about it, not doing it, obviously. Uh, and, uh, um, <laughs> and, uh, and sharing the information. Um, but, um, but people, when you talk to people about aviation, for example, a lot of people say, well, but I can't really get on board with that campaign because I'm a hypocrite, because I fly. Um, and I think um, with a lot of things that, you, uh, that we work on, there are people who really take, you know, they take it as a personal attack on their lifestyle choices. And whilst we do all need to be, um, our lifestyle choices definitely have a massive impact, um, I think the best place to approach this from is to just be conscious about all of the, life, the, the things that we do. Yes like none of us will ever be perfect in all of the things that we do in, in, in this way. But um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question properly, but, but I think, kind of, <laughs> but I think, um, you know, it, it is important that we work on cha uh, changing those lifestyle choices, but that alone isn't going to, to give us what we need. It's a very important part of the picture. Um, and... I suppose it's like where we can form alliances with the things that we're fighting against. We can also form alliances with the people who are forming the solutions as well. Um, and, and I suppose that's where maybe like the, the kind of degrowth um, uh, idea can come into play, where we can form alliances through the solutions. So there are, you know, people think that in um, the global south there aren't solutions. There are, but often there are 
um, reasons why those are being restricted through trade agreements or through, you know, like, yeah, international agreements. So actually there's, there's, there's still a lot of work that we can do in, in forming alliances around degrowth, I think. I don't know, did I answer that? Yeah. Not this, <laughs> not really. Maybe, we, yeah, let's, talk, let's talk afterwards then. Another question? Hey. Yeah, um, I'll also ask in English. Um, I, I was massively inspired by the Heathrow 13 action, uh, so kudos for that. And I know I'm not the only one here. Um, that was really cool. And um, yeah, so in, in, in German activist circles, we've also been thinking about sort of airport actions ever since. Um, and I was just going to ask, you mentioned that there's a mass action plan, and if there's anything maybe that... Um, groups here could do to support that particular struggle in the UK at the moment? It's, um, yeah, it's interesting because in the UK, what I'm trying, what we're finding is that, like I was saying, you know, people are like, mm, I don't know if I can get on board with this because I'm a hypocrite. And actually, what we're realizing is that um, certainly the, the, the issues around aviation are largely unknown so even amongst climate activists people generally don't know they know that that flying is produces carbon emissions carbon emissions are bad there there is no way to decarbonize flying so in order to decarbonize we need less um planes like simple and we cannot expand any any airport that's that's sort of everybody's on board with that but what people genuinely don't realize is that um, it is an, um, in the world, definitely in, like, definitely in the UK, but actually even more so around the world, it is an affluent minority of people who are doing most of the flying. And so most people, when you talk about aviation um, expansion and you say you want to stop a airport expansion and we need to stop, we need to fly less, everybody feels that everybody just needs to stop flying and therefore I'm telling you and I'm telling this working class family over here that you can't have your holiday a year because uh, everybody needs to cut down on flying. And yes, from a climate perspective, ideologically it would be great if we could all stop flying, that would be like fantastic. But, um, but, but in terms of a strategic approach, we need to like we can focus on who's, who's doing most of the flying. So for example, in the UK, 15% of the population account for 70% of the flights. And we know that it's a wealthy minority of people who are doing most of the flying. So what, what I'm realizing is that it's information, you know, spreading that information and making people aware of that issue, even if they're not coming on board with, that, um, with the action, but, to, but to, to help spread that information is actually is really important. Um, and I think um, we are the action that we're doing. It's actually quite a sort of family-friendly action. It's, a, it's like a, a flash mob type um, occupation but, and, a, and a bike ride. But there are actions happening in other parts of the world. So on the same day in Austria, there's a, there's a big action happening on October the 1st, Saturday, October the 1st. There's a big action happening in Vienna against their airport there. Um, in um, Lazade in France, in Nantes, around the Notre Dame de Londres uh, uh, proposed airport, there will be a big action happening the week after. Uh, in... Um, uh, Tur in Turkey, there are actions happening against an airport. Um, the forest defenders um, are, are taking action. And also in Mexico, around the airport um, in Atenco, just outside Mexico City. So there are lots of things happening, and it's about, um, yes, yeah, spreading information around that, I guess, is a, really, is a, is a good start. Um, and then if anybody wants to... Uh, helping us, because we don't necessarily know about all the projects, so if there are other projects, I believe there's a, a big airport resistance happening in Munich, um, so it would be really good to, to help build those connections um, so that we can talk to each other and, and work together.
Taky. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if it will be a question or a, a comment. So yeah, like we, as we talk about climate change being a disaster and this exploitation of mineral resources. So this is what is currently happening, you know. These are the results, but if we look at the cost, like we should, we cannot have a solution. Okay, we have alliances, but we should have like a cost. What cause these problems we have today? So it was colonization, you know. Through colonization, our people were exploited. Mother Earth mineral resources were exploited as well. So in a way to move, in a way to build alliances, for example, where I come from, uh, like it is the place, it's like an environmental crime scene for multinational companies, you know. And also, okay, in Nigeria, I talk about Ogoniland. It was Dutch company who was operating there. People who are fighting against uh, companies like from England, Germany, Switzerland, and whatsoever. What, what are the people doing there? And still, like, to protect this uh, colonization, you know, there were some people who were given privilege based on the color of their skin. So to have... Uh, Alliances still have people who are committed to protect this privilege they have, you know. So for me, I don't know what it means. My skin never was never given a privilege. It's always under privilege. So to build these alliances first, we should start people stop defending themselves, you know. We should know uh, Global South, or we have problems everywhere, but the main cause is colonization and it's from the Global North until people like admit this. And don't get me wrong, you know, and like, oh, maybe this guy, no, I don't have a problem with any individual, but we should know, you know, what is the cause and what you can do. Does it make no sense for us in South Africa, for example, to fight a British company? And this British company, they corrupt our leaders, and our president, no one is corrupt until he's being offered money. Who offered them money? They are corrupt to the British government, and then they say, ah, oh, no, South African government is corrupt, there's nothing we can do about it. So first, there yeah, is to build alliances, people should realize they are most part of the problem, you know, and solutions should come from them. Many people, like in the struggle, have been killed. Even today, they are still being killed in South Africa. Activists lose their life. So on the global note, what people are doing about it, we fight our governments and we fight against their governments too. So we have double problems, you know. We can. If the Global North can fight their own government and their companies, for us, our governments, we can be able to squeeze them, you know. But if they have assistance from the Global South, it makes uh, it much more double problem in a way. So, yeah, like the solution should come from the Global North as well, because we are not satisfied by the action they have. And still we find the ways where their actions are being justified in a way, and still this privilege they have, they still want to protect it, and people don't want to leave their comfort zone in a way. So solutions should come from them, and then they build alliances to us, yeah. You want to come in first, but maybe, Nimo, you also want to come here? I just, I think it's a massive thank you so much for that, because it's a really important point. And I didn't even mention the word decolonialization, actually, and I wanted to. I talked about race, but, and I talked about global south. But actually, when it, decolonialization is, sometimes it's like the elephant in the room. This is an English phrase that I taught somebody today. It's like the big thing in the room that we're not talking about. And sometimes that is the elephant in the room in the organizations that we're working with as well. And, and we do need to, to um, acknowledge that more. Like when I said we have a long way to go, they're, they're, we're, I feel like it, conversations are just now beginning. And, and there are movements like the... Uh, like movements that we can work with um, that that can we that can help us you know um, address that um, but yeah th it's a it's a really important thing for us to be acknowledging um, that and that we have that privileged position uh, which means that we have more work that we need to do to redress that balance <laughs> 